So this homecoming marks the 60th for Fred Bergson, uh, who graduated from Central in 1961. He continued his education at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He spent more than a decade in the public sector, including a stint as Under Secretary of the Treasury for International Affairs under President Carter. Uh, in 1981, he created one of the most influential think tanks in the world, the Institute for International Economics. And he headed that institute for the next 31 years, after which he continued serving American presidents in an advisory role. He's been honored not only by our country, but also by the governments of France, Germany, South Korea, and Sweden. There is much more to say, but rather than listen to me, I'm sure you'd rather hear from the person whom USA Today called one of the 10 people who can change your life, Fred Bergson. Well, John spoke without the microphone, and I'll try to do the same. Maybe it's picking up a little. Yes. But if you, can, if you can't hear me in the back, wave, and otherwise I'll just go ahead. Uh, John, that was a very nice introduction, but there was one thing you didn't say, fortunately. Uh, it's true, USA Today did say that I was one of the 10 people who could change your life. But the full quote was as follows. He's one of the 10 people who could change your life that you've never heard of. <laughs> Probably the second part was more accurate than the first part, <laughs> but uh, it was nice in any event, and thank you for having a, uh, uh, only a half quote of that, uh, of that famous indication. Uh, it's great to be back here on campus. Uh, I'm very gratified by the turnout. I don't know if that's because some of you remember what I said on the last occasion, or because you did not remember what I said on the last occasion. <laughs> But in any event, I'll try to uh, update a lot of the stuff that I've talked about here before, and uh, then open it up for questions and discussion later on. Uh, I'm going to talk about a pretentious topic, the state of the world, as I labeled it. But it's really to try to emphasize how the state of the world economy, the global economy, is critically important for every American all of us in this room, all of our country. Americans often don't realize that, kind of thinking of the United States, a big self-contained economy and society, but in truth, we are an integral part of a world economy, we are heavily dependent on it, and if it doesn't go right, it costs us a lot. In the last 75 years, since the Second World War, we've had a basically open, cooperative, global economic system of relatively free trade and financial stability and the like, which has been enormously important for the United States. In direct economic terms, major studies done at my institute over the years have shown that the United States is at least $2 trillion per year richer as a result of our integration in the world economy over this past half century. That's about 10% of our total economy. It's about $10,000 per individual in this country. In short, we're a lot better off as a result of our integration. That's freer trade, meaning we get cheaper and better quality imports. We can export more and get higher wages from the export jobs that are produced. A whole range of economic effects, competitive pressures that force us to do better, be more productive, have higher standards of living. So we get very big direct economic benefits. In addition, our foreign policy has been enormously strengthened by the open, cooperative, and essentially integrated world economy. Note that there's been no war between great powers for the last 75 years. It's called the law of peace by international relations experts. And, and a very important part of that in addition, of course, to our military deterrence, has been this open and integrated world economic system where people didn't go to war with each other because of economic difficulties, economic conflicts, and the like. Not to say the system was perfect, but it kept the peace. And then thirdly, and this is the thing we don't really realize as much as we should, this global economy of this last 75 years was largely shaped by the United States coming out of the Second World War. 
we and our allies put together the so-called Bretton Woods system with the International Monetary Fund, the Seattle World Trade Organization, and we set up a system of rules based on pretty open and free markets, based largely on the rule of law, based largely on democratic political principles, and all of that was essentially a world shaped by US norms, which were hugely in our interest, and meant that all of us in our daily lives, though we don't really realize it or think about it very much, are living in a world shaped by our own preferences. Now, that may seem to all of you young folks, even folks of my age, uh, as being axiomatic, as kind of the natural order of things. But it's very important to realize that it wasn't always that way. In fact, just before the Second World War, in fact, a major cause of the Second World War, was the Global Depression of the 1930s. And most serious students of that 1930s concur that a central reason, perhaps the main reason, for the onset of the Great Depression, the worst economic calamity in modern history, maybe in all of history, was the breakdown of international economic cooperation. <laughs> Countries waged trade wars against each other, waged currency wars against each other, competitively devalued their currencies, tried to beggar thy neighbors. In short, the world economy spiraled down and down and down, and national recessions, bad as they were, morphed into a global conflagration and global depression, which along with some other things going on, but deeply related, brought on the Second World War. And then the reaction afterwards to try to avoid that problem ever occurring again. But now we begin to see some echoes of those problems of the earlier period. The trade wars that have broken out between the United States and China over the last three years could be only the beginning of a new breakdown of international comedy, cooperation, and global economic harmony. The US and China, as you know, I suspect, have raised trade barriers hugely against each other, been in deep conflict over their currency policies, are now fighting each other tooth and nail on the technology front, and in short, raising the specter of a reversion away from that kind of open and effective global economic system we've had for so long into something more resembling the nasty past. Now I said that one analysis, perhaps a dominant analysis of the depression of the 1930s was a breakdown of cooperation. <laughs> and the specific concern was a failure of economic leadership. A failure of any country to be both able and willing to step into the breach and save the day, which the US has done quite frequently during the post-war period. What happened in the 1930s was that the traditional leader of the world economy at that time, still Great Britain, coming off its having been dominant back in the 19th century, Great Britain no longer was able, no longer had the clout, the power, to be able to resolve global economic problems on its own. And the United States, which by then was already the biggest economy in the world, was not willing to step in, was isolationist, was xenophobic, actually made things much worse by putting on huge tariffs, the Smoot-Hawley tariff, by devaluing the currency enormously when we already were running a trade surplus, by torpedoing a World Economic Conference in 1933 that tried to pull things together and put it back together. So it was a failure of leadership that led to a breakdown of the global economy because the incumbent leader was no longer able and the putative new leader, us, was not yet willing or responsible and indeed was grossly irresponsible. Now that's the stage setting for where we are today because the rise of China presents the first real challenge in the last hundred years to two things, to US global economic leadership and to an open and cooperative world economy. China has already become 
of roughly co-equal power to the United States. I've just finished a book on this topic. I literally signed off on the page proofs earlier this week. It'll be out early next year. The title, so you can order it, <laughs> is the United States versus China, uh, the quest for global economic leadership. It tells the story. I'm going to draw on that a bit in my remarks today. China is already, for all practical purposes, the equal of the United States in terms of global economic power. There are two different ways to compare economy sizes, GDPs of national economies, uh, two different ways to use the exchange rate calculation. On one of those, China already became larger than the United States six or seven years ago, and is already the world's biggest economy, ahead of us now by 15, 20 percent. On the other measure, which is probably a little more widely used for these purposes, it will pass us within the next decade, no doubt about it. But the key thing is that China is growing three times as fast as we are, at a minimum. If we continue to grow at 2% a year in real terms, that'll be pretty good by our own historical record and by the record of other countries. China, though it's not anymore growing at 10% a year, as it did for 30 years after its reforms in the late 1970s, is still growing at least at 6%, maybe a little more. So it's growing three times as fast as we are, which means if you look, put those curves together, that it's not only approaching us and passing us quickly, it's going to keep going and open that gap a lot more in the future. China is already the world's largest trading country. It's already the world's largest holder of foreign exchange reserves by far. It holds over $3 trillion worth of dollars foreign exchange. We have something like half a trillion. No other country has more than one trillion. China is by far the biggest. It's the world's biggest creditor country by a mile. So on almost any metric that you want to choose, China is a global economic superpower, is moving upside, uh, up alongside the United States, and for the indefinite future, unless they implode, which I think is possible but not likely, uh, they're going to be, for all practical purposes, our equal. But what does that mean for the United States and the world as a whole? There are three basic changes that the rise of China may portend for the world and for us. And it goes back to those things I mentioned before that we have been taking for granted for most of the last century. One's economic, one's political, and one's strategic. On the economic side, the Chinese don't really like free markets. They marketized a lot of their own economy with their reforms of the late 1970s and unleash that enormous growth path. But particularly over the last decade, under the leadership of Xi Jinping, who may be their president for another 15 years or even more, they have reverted to basically state control, dominated by the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, driven by the political objective of maintaining the dominance of the CCP and bringing China to what it views as its legitimate world role of, again, a dominant country, like it was back in the days of the Middle Kingdom in the 17 and 1800s. Economically, they don't like free markets. They don't want open econo economies to control what they do for political reasons. And so, as they become ascendant on the global scene, you will see more and more seizing up of markets, trade, investment, the trade wars that I already mentioned are the clearest example so far. Those trade wars launched in a direct sense by President Trump were responding in large part to the Chinese controls over trade and investment that they had been maintaining themselves for a long time, disadvantaged us and other foreigners, and finally became intolerable. I don't think Trump's response was tactically correct, I'll come back to that, but there certainly was a real problem caused by China and threatening to erode the fundamental tenets of the global economic system that had been so successful and from which they themselves had benefited enormously. So there's an economic dimension. Market versus state control. The Chinese are on one side of that. 
we remain largely on the other. But you can look around the world and see country after country gravitating in China's direction, emulating the Chinese, sometimes retaliating against them, as in our case, but meaning more control, less globalization, less cooperation, economic cost, political risk. The second set of risks that the Chinese raise are directly political. To put it mildly, there are no democracy. Uh, in terms of our basic values, human rights, concern for oppressed minorities, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Taiwan, all of those issues are, of course, diametrically different in our value system and theirs. As China gains international clout and presence, you'll see less democracy and more autocracy. Whether it's the extreme authoritarian version that we now see under Xi Jinping, or something a little milder, we don't know, uh, but one should not bet on it becoming any more banal. So that's the political risk. The strategic risk, then, is that China clearly wants to supplant the United States as the world's dominant country. Uh, the Chinese have something that they could call the 100-year marathon, uh, a strategy which they launched way back a long time ago, but is frequently re-renunciated and re-announced, denunciated by Chinese leaders, that it is their goal by the 100th anniversary of the communist takeover of China, 1949, so 2049, to become the world's dominant country, and to displace or replace the United States. Uh, they put it in different terms at different times, but it's clear that that's a widely held objective in China, that they are moving resolutely toward it, and that they feel it's now quite achievable and within their grasp. For the reasons I mentioned, they feel that their ascendance already to top economic status in many of these uh, dimensions enables them to aspire to be the globally dominant country based on a globally dominant economy uh, within the foreseeable future. Now, I hasten to say, unless you get the wrong impression, that I do not think the United States is in any generalized decline. Uh, Americans, from time to time, think we're declining, thought the Soviet Union was going to bury us, or Japan was going to bury us, or something of that type. Uh, and some Americans now are apocalyptic as they view the, the China challenge. Uh, but there are really no signs of the U.S. going into terminal decline. Uh, as I said, our growth rate's a lot less than China's, but that's normal for a mature economy. Uh, since the end of the Cold War 30 years ago, our economic growth has actually been superior to that of all the other high-income countries, uh, much better than Europe, better than Japan. Uh, our relative share of the rich world has gotten bigger over the last 30 years, far from declining, as the British did over a long century period uh, as they faded the global threat uh, preoccupation. Pre uh, we increased our share. Uh, China and a few other emerging markets, developing countries, have been increasing as everybody else, but it's not because the U.S. is in some <coughs> fundamental uh, uh, throes of uh, fading away. Now, we've got big economic problems. I'll come back to those uh, toward the end just the things we need to do, and there are plenty of them. Uh, but in terms of aggregate economic performance, uh, the U.S. is not, not in bad shape at all, and certainly is capable, certainly is capable of responding to the China challenge. The question is whether we have the will to do so. As I did my, my book, I kind of traced carefully U.S. policy in this area over the last 50, 75 years, and the message is that U.S. leadership, though it has still been pretty uh, predominant in the world economy until, until Trump, who almost abdicated, uh, I'll come back to that too, but the U.S. leadership was actually declining gradually over a 25-year period, going back to maybe the, the mid-1990s, uh, for reasons related to our domestic political problems. Uh, I'm coming from Washington.
Washington. I've been in or close to that uh, scene for almost 60 years. And I must say, it is by far the worst that one could ever have imagined. One could hardly have imagined how bad it has become in terms of political polarization, identity politics, yes, racism, uh, an unwillingness to cooperate domestically. And if you can't cooperate domestically, you're going to have a hard time leading world cooperation on an international basis. Um, President Trump was the extreme version of that, uh, literally, in many cases, abdicating US global leadership. Uh, of all his many mistakes, probably the worst was attacking our own allies. Uh, he raised trade barriers against our allies. He trashed NATO. Uh, he dissed our closest uh, neighbors in Canada and Mexico. He almost deliberately abrogated US economic leadership and turned everybody against us. Um, the rest of the world tried to hang on and basically did so through four years. But the real problem is that it wasn't just Trump, although he was the extreme version of it. The erosion of US global leadership really goes back way before Trump, as I say, to the mid-90s. And in some senses, the Democrats are just as bad or worse than Trumpist Republicans. Because the Democrats, too, have opposed globalization, have opposed new trade agreements, have opposed the kind of cooperative leadership that the United States has exercised in the past. Uh, you saw in the 2016 campaign, Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders both came out against the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was Obama's big effort. Uh, Democrats took credit for torpedoing that initiative, which was the latest failure of US leadership, uh, even though it was Trump that withdrew us when he came into office. Um, so the rest of the world is asking the following question. What is the new normal for the United States? Is it Trump or is it Biden? And they don't know. The truth is, they don't know. Which way is the U.S. headed? Is there going to be a resumption of Trumpism with or without Trump itself? Or is there going to be an effort by Democrats to move back in the other direction? But then they're not so sure of that either. So they have to ask, what has Biden done? And the answer is, not much. Uh, his tone has been a lot better. Uh, he's civil, not cantankerous about everything. He certainly doesn't lie uh, frequently, like his predecessor. Uh, he's certainly more congenial in both his domestic politics and his international relations. But when you ask what he's done yet, it ain't much. And already, allies, adversaries like China are beginning to say, well, maybe this is not so different after all, and maybe we just have to deal with the United States that is no longer going to play the role that it did for that previous century, leading, inspiring, propelling the world economy in those constructive directions that I talked about. Now, the US is going to have to do several things. It's going to have to deal effectively with China in direct terms, because as I say, China poses the first real challenge to the United States for global leadership in a century. That could lead to conflict. There's something in political science theory called the Thucydides trap, which goes back to the battles between Athens and Sparta, uh, BC. Uh, but the point is that there is an inherent tension. Anytime a rising power gets ready to pass the incumbent power to take global economic supremacy. It's an inherent problem. A very famous Harvard political scientist has analyzed the 20 cases uh, over the last two millennia where such transitions have taken place and concluded that 16 of them led to war. The 
transition that most people feel is most comparable to where we are now was the one that happened at the end of the 19th century when Germany under Kaiser Wilhelm and Bismarck uh, challenged Great Britain, then the incumbent, for global leadership. And sure enough, that led to war. And there was a lot of similarities in terms of technology competition, a world that had a lot of globalization, uh, very close comparisons between that period and now, a lot of lessons to be learned and hopefully unlearned. So at risk of real conflict between the rising power and the incumbent power, something called power transition theory shows that the height of that risk comes at the crossover point. When the ascending power is just about at the level of the incumbent, about to pass it, but that's where we are right now. And over the next decade or two, that's where we're going to be on different metrics, but with China, as I said at the outset, approaching, equating, and then passing the United States. So it raises the risk of this Thucydides trap. The other problem is the one I mentioned before, that in that kind of world, it's not clear who's going to lead the global economy when and if new crises emerge. Could it be again like the 1930s, where the incumbent, now the United States, no longer has either the clout to do it by itself or maybe the will to do it. And the new power, China, may not want to exercise responsible leadership at all, it just kind of grab what it can for itself in a narrow mercantilistic sense. And so nobody leads and the world again spirals down. So those are two almost existential risks to face the world economy and through it, of course, the world more broadly in political and security terms. We will have to respond to China much more effectively than we have so far. Trump basically pursued a policy of containment, trying to contain China's rise, slow it down, even stop it. That was a demonstrable, disastrous failure. China not only kept growing faster than we, but even in the face of the coronavirus pandemic, the gap between China's growth and our growth actually expanded, and they've grown faster than the previous gap and expanded their lead on us from where they were before. Uh, their share of world markets rose despite Trump's tariffs to deny them some sales to the United States. Uh, so it's a demonstrable failure. You cannot contain an economy the size, dynamism, <laughs> power of China. One reason you cannot is because none of your allies will go with you. None of them share the view containment's the right approach. None of them agreed with Trump. None of them went along with it. As I said, he actually trashed our allies and made it even harder to get them to cooperate with us, uh, but they wouldn't have agreed uh, to any kind of pursuit of containment of China anyway. Uh, and thirdly, if we did try to contain China, as the Chinese suspect we're trying to do anyway, uh, they would simply have greater resolve to beat us to the punch. They're trying very hard already, but they try even harder if they thought that the literally the United States and its allies, if the allies could ever be persuaded to go along, were trying to hold them down and resist their growing to what they view as a fully legitimate recovery of their traditional global status. So containment won't work. What I propose in my book is what I call, as a mouthful, conditional competitive cooperation might sound <laughs> contradictory to you, but it's not. What it really says is that you have to distinguish among the issues that you're dealing with with China. There are some issues, some security issues, like the South China Sea, Taiwan, uh, a few others, where we and China will almost certainly remain at loggerheads. There are certainly political and values issues human rights issues, the Uyghurs, Hong Kong, etc., where we in China are not ever going to agree. So there will be continued uh, uh, disagreement and even hostility on some of those issues. 
But there's another domain of issues where I think we have to seek cooperation. If China and the United States are the two dominant economies in the world, and when you put the two together, they're going to be well over half the world economy for the foreseeable centuries. Uh, you can't get anything done positively in terms of managing the world economy unless the US and China agree. If they disagree, the much greater risk is trade war, conflict, breakdown. So you have to find a way to get together. The place where it's most obvious now, and there are newspapers every day, big summit meeting coming up in the next few days in Glasgow, is climate change. Unless the United States and China can agree to take really dramatic new initiatives to reduce carbon emissions, methane emissions, and the like, the planet is going to boil. And that's as simple as it is, because unless those two put their own policies in place to deal with climate change effectively and cooperate with each other to then lead the rest of the world, the Indias and Russias and others in turn, world is in deep, deep difficulty. The coronavirus pandemic is another dramatic case in point where bad behavior on both sides, particularly in this case the Chinese side, uh, has undermined the chances for uh, maximizing the success of the vaccines and bringing the global pandemic to an end and thereby reducing the risk to all of us here at home. Those are global commons issues issues where what we call global public goods are, required, are involved, where uh, individual countries have to take national steps in the interest of greater global outcomes in order to meet their own internal needs. But then there's this whole range of economic issues that I've talked about, trade, currency, technology, and the like, where I think we have to decouple the economic global commons issues from the security and political issues in order to be able to move effectively and keep the world economy together for the foreseeable future. Now, a lot of people talk about decoupling, by which they mean decouple the US from China. And that was essentially Trump's containment approach. Decouple, just cut them off, treat them like we used to treat the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Uh, and just uh, let them live in their own sphere, and we'll live in ours, and all will be well. The problem, of course, is the Soviet Union never had an economy that was of any interest to anybody. Neither the Soviet Union then nor Russia now makes anything that anybody wants. And so there was no economic interdependence, no gain from trade that we got from dealing with the Soviet <coughs> Union and its allies. So it was easy uh, to uh, excise them from the world economy no cost. Very different with China. From what you read every day in the paper about supply chains breaking down in the wake of the coronavirus and such, it's obvious that supply chains have to continue to include China to enable the world economy to continue to function effectively. You can't just decouple uh, the US from China in any aggregate sense. It would be folly, and you couldn't do it anyway, just in technical terms. So you have to find a way to achieve this different kind of decoupling decoupling of issues, where you work out ways to cooperate on a conditional basis. Chinese have to make major changes in their own policies, I mentioned before, their trade policies, uh, but find ways to persuade them to do that in their own interest in maintaining economic openness, uh, and conduct policies in that area quite different from what you do in the security and political area. Now that's vis-a-vis -vis China itself. The final thing I say in my opening remarks is that none of that is possible. None of that more constructive policy with China itself is possible unless and until we get our act together at home much more effectively. The erosion of US political comity, the, the arising of partisanship and uh, politicization that we see so omnipresent now in our politics uh, has, of course, some deep economic roots. 
because despite our aggregate economic uh, progress and success, we've got big problems. The two, the two big ones are wage stagnation and income maldistribution. Um, for many Americans and many groups of Americans, wages have essentially been stagnant or even declining for somewhere between 20 and 40 years. And that's unprecedented for a major advanced developed economy. And it obviously leads to great disquietude, unhappiness, dissatisfaction on the part of a lot of people, and they're therefore looking to change the way things are happening and do something about it. The other big one is income distribution. Again, it's well known how most of the gains, or a large part of the gains of our aggregate economy over the last several decades has gone to the top 10%, top 1%, top one-tenth of 1%, 1 and been skewed in such an excessive way that it's just increasingly viewed as an unfair economy, one which discriminates against uh, people, particularly of, of race and uh, minority status, but which uh, uh, leaves a big percentage of the population wanting and dissatisfied feeling a need for something different. Now, globalization and trade often get blamed for those problems. Uh, the truth is they are a cause of those problems. Uh, they're a minority cause. Uh, a whole encyclopedia of studies at my institute and elsewhere have shown that somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of those broader U.S. economic problems can be traced to our international involvement. Uh, but the bigger changes bigger causes of the changes are technology, changes in demand pattern. Uh, nobody, uh, nobody would want to uh, legislate against robots, uh, but that's in fact the cause of the uh, problem much more than international trade or, or the Chinese. But it's of course easier to blame the foreigners than to blame the robots, and so you get a lot of uh, reaction against the international uh, involvement in the United States. But that would be throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Where the U.S. has been totally inadequate in dealing with these problems is the failure to deal effectively with the legitimate difficulties faced by the people who are disadvantaged by trade, globalization, and the like. Uh, we have programs to provide side payments and offsetting compensation for people who are lost out. We have training programs and, and uh, education programs to try to strengthen the capability of people to adjust to economic change, whether from trade or anything else, but they've never been carried out effectively or with enough resources. And so it's quite understandable, in fact, that the small number, relatively small number of people who have been hurt have been very vocal about it, and that that number has increased over time and with the failure to deal with their problems effectively and in a humane way, uh, the political resistance has risen, and that's been true in both parties. Paradoxically, uh, Trump actually showed an answer to that. Uh, when Trump's tariffs against China and other countries led to retaliation against U.S. agricultural exports, Trump showered money on the farmers, uh, of which I'm one. I own a farm up here in northwestern Missouri. Uh, but Trump showered $16 billion on the farmers year before last, $12 billion last year, uh, essentially a payoff uh, to compensate them for their lost sales due to his trade war. And as a result, they stuck with him. The farmers stuck with him and voted for him to a large part in last year's election. Uh, now, I don't recommend that as a general policy, but it does show that if you compensate the losers, you could offset the political cost that you experience. Uh, but we haven't done it. And so the buildup of rancor and dissatisfaction with the international position is quite understandable. The problems, of course, are broader than that. We can't just deal with the trade displaced workers. We need to deal with the overall problem of wage stagnation and income inequality. I think Biden is trying to do that now with these bills that are being considered literally as we speak here uh, to 
try to make some initial steps in the direction of rectifying some of those imbalances within the economy, within the society. But it's at best only a start. Biden is also right, I think, to say that he doesn't want to address trade issues, international economic issues, until there's been some progress in dealing with the domestic problems, which would then strengthen the political foundation for the US to again play an effective leadership role in the world economy. We do have to put our house in order first. I think Biden came into office clearly recognizing that, saying he wanted to do it, and is now trying to do it. Will he be able to achieve enough? Hard to say. So the questions that many of us Americans raise, many foreigners raise, what is, the, what is the norm for the future? Is it Biden, or is it Trump, or is it something else? The honest answer is we don't know. But the risks of not getting our house in order are enormous for the reasons I've indicated. The Chinese are coming. They are the first real challenge to America in a century. They're the first real challenge to an open world economy and system based on markets, democracy, and rule of law that we've had in a century. And so we had better shape up and face it or else we're in big trouble. I talked about a lot of this uh, when I gave a Gaddis lecture here 15 years ago. Some of you may have been here. Uh, I don't know if I'll be back in another 15, <laughs> but if I am, we can see how it came out and talk about it then. I'm glad to meet with you all today, and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you may have. Thank you very much. As I said, one of the areas that may be the forefront of the U.S.-China competition right now is technology. Uh, and it's true in third countries, like you say, Latin America and elsewhere, uh, where China is unashamedly trying to export its technologies to uh, uh, achieve its political purposes and make inroads in those countries. But of course, it's true in our own country, too. We have a lot of decisions to make. Some have been made, many more still to make, as to what Chinese technologies to permit into our own economy. Now, what makes that really complicated, of course, is that many of those technologies have military and security implications, as well as economic implications. So we, je we risk jeopardizing our national security if we permit technologies to integrate into our own economy that uh, that can lead to more spying. I mean, China cheats uh, very blatantly in stealing intellectual property, uh, stealing uh, our technology, uh, letting their technology then just give them more avenues to which to do that. So that's at the forefront of the competition, and we have to be extremely, extremely uh, vigilant in, uh, in watching it. At the same time, we don't want to go overboard and decouple from everything because a lot of it does not threaten our security or our economy, and in fact, we benefit from it. So it's a really delicate balancing act. The U.S. government's only in the early stages of figuring out how to do it, but it's, it's right at the forefront. Yes, ma'am. Um, okay, like, what's in, like, the common person do? Like, okay, I, I care, but I don't know what to do about it. What do I do about it? I think the main thing you want to do is vote people into office that are aware of the problem, <coughs> will talk about it in a positive and constructive way, and try to do things constructively to deal with it. Now, you may have, you might have different views than I do as to what those constructive ways are, but that's the issue. Uh, I mean, there's so many, there's so many topics now that are dominating U.S. politics that it totally ignore the things that I'm talking about today, which really are at the core of our future as a society, uh, that that's gotta be rectified. I mean, these issues that I'm talking about today, the China threat, uh, our whole economic and social posture, those things have to be US political priorities. 
you know, we've got a big election in my home state of Virginia uh, coming up Tuesday. Well, it's in, in, in train right now. And you know, the Republican candidate uh, for a long time made election integrity the center of his campaign in a state that has impeccable voting procedures. It's just absurd. And I could tick off a whole bunch of other issues that are at the top of the priority list, which are absurd. So. That's the best you can do, but you can also try to talk, write, lobby, uh, and uh, hope your friends do the same thing. Can we talk about saying you can just vote people in? What about people running for council or uh, the treasury or the Fed, like uh, Yellen or Powell? Do you think they'll give as much power as the president when they can just print money uh, randomly? Um, Well, yeah, and, and I, I think we're not going to and should not vote for the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. But uh, those people are appointed by the political leaders. And so ultimately it's the same answer. You, you want political leaders that will appoint responsible people to be Secretary of the Treasury, to be chairman of the Fed, to, to play those absolute key roles in the economy. Uh, but of course, the Congress is central to all of this, as we're seeing right now. At the end of the day, the presidents, you know, presidents propose, but the congressmen implement. And uh, at the end of the day, it's the congressmen who really do make most of the critical decisions uh, on all these issues, particularly the domestic ones. So having responsible congressmen is, uh, is, is irreplaceable. Now, we've got structural problems, of course. I'm sure you all know the famous gerrymandering problem with you know, the way the districts have been increasingly rejiggered so that very few districts are really competitive between the parties, therefore the competition is within the parties, and that means the extreme of both right and Republican, left and Democrats come to the fore, and you get the polarization that is a major, major factor for the political dysfunction that we face now. Uh, and that's a political issue that can be rectified by the voters, but uh, has to be done with a lot of, a lot of effort and forethought. If I might, I follow a question as well, just about the 1998. Uh, do you have any comment or opinion on inflation? We're not quite heavy with that. Uh, the CPI says we're about 2%, but the original, in 1980, CPI may have more like 15% per year. Do I understand? Well, no, 15 is, 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 uh, is, is not accurate, but headline inflation now is close to 5%. Uh, core inflation, excluding energy and food, is still down around two or three. Uh, there is a bump up in inflation, no doubt about it. And the question, the abiding question right now, is whether it's going to be permanent or, or one shot and aberration. Uh, I'm somewhere in between. Uh, I think it'll probably stay up at three or 4% for a while. I don't think that's terrible particularly if it enables the economy to make a good, strong recovery uh, from the pandemic. Uh, but it means the Fed will have to start tightening uh, sooner than they had uh, intended. Yeah? Yeah, thank you for your question. You don't want to ask a question? Uh, no, I just want to make sure you're <laughs> 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 Oh, okay. thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Well, I just want to know, if, um, do you think that Trump had a, a better plan, like strategically, to um, take down the Chinese? Yes, he had no plan. Uh, he, like everything else, he acted uh, instinctively, uh, spontaneously, impetuously, by tweet, you know. He had no plan. And, and you can read details of Bob Woodward's books on the uh, Trump presidency. Uh, just lay that out very clearly. He had people within his administration who proposed plans, but nothing systematic was ever adopted or implemented. Uh, read uh, John Bolton's book. Bolton was his national security advisor, you know, uh, late part of his administration. Uh, Bolton has written a, a very uh, revealing book on how uh, Trump approached foreign policy, including toward China, 
And it was very clear. There was no strategic thought at all. It was all transactional, it was all instinctive. And of course, being Trump, it was all personal. It was all about him. Uh, so uh, according to people who sympathized with his bottom line, i.e. a tough line on China, he was hopeless because even when he wanted to do what they thought was the right thing, he just didn't know how to go about it. So on the economic front, uh, all these tariffs did was impose costs on Americans because the Ameri Americans pay the tariffs, not the Chinese, and we pay at higher prices, higher costs. Uh, it, it raised our allies because they got hit also Forced the, the force, it induced the Chinese to take an even tougher line against us and say, ah, we better decouple from the Americans because we can't rely on them, and so we better produce it ourselves, like semiconductors. So uh, it was a total failure. Uh, in a way, it's a shame because he, his policy had the advantage of getting China's attention all right. China had thought the US was pretty soft on it prior to that away with murder, which they did. Uh, so he got their attention, but unfortunately he didn't carry it out in an effective way. I think Biden's got the germ of a start when he wants to restore the US alliances and essentially form a multilateral coalition to go after the Chinese uh, uh, aggressive policies not from the US unilaterally, but monolaterally with a wide group of countries around the world. The Chinese have demonstrated that they can resist American unilateral pressure. They did it on currency for 10 years, they've now done it on trade for over five. Uh, they don't like to be isolated internationally. And so if we could forge a multilateral coalition that would confront them with a serious game plan as to how to enable them to get out of their regressive policies gradually over time and without losing faith, then they might be able to pull it off. Uh, when Trump said, you know, America first, what he wound up with was America alone. And that was the real problem. There was no strategy. So in a way, it was a wake up call, but it wasn't, uh, wasn't destined to have any positive payout. It's a good question. Again. Do you think there would be a beneficial effect of incentivizing businesses to move back into manufacturing in the United States in order to try and boost our economy? Well, I don't, I don't have any great preference for manufacturing over services. The service is about 80% of our economy. Uh, manufacturing is actually not declining. Some people think manufacturing is declining. It's not declining. Man, the manufacturing share of the US economy is about 20%, has been there for about 20 years. What has been declining is the number of jobs in manufacturing because productivity has continued to rise so fast. So you've had a reduction in the share of manufacturing workers in the total labor force, but the share of manufacturing the economy stayed about 20%. It's actually gone back up a little in the last couple of years. But I don't think there's any particular reason to prefer manufacturing services. Many services sectors have higher wages than the manufacturing. And I think our future is probably that direction rather than trying to bring back you know, brick and mortar uh, factories of the type we had in the past. Let's have one last question. We're approaching one o'clock. It's Mary Jane. Could you come to your chair at Central <laughs> <laughs> so we can hear about your thoughts on North Korea? Well, I don't pretend to know much about some of them, but uh, uh, I think I'm probably a little, uh, a little beyond the pale to come back and teach at Central, but uh, I'll, I'll try to keep in touch. Thank you very much, Fred.